pretty eyes, pretty thighs, shawty she a dime Demon girl, evil eyes, she be telling lies so today it is my pleasure to interview Dr. Aparna Baduri, the assistant professor of biological chemistry at UCLA. So Dr. Baduri, thank you for being part of this episode. In light of a successful career, can you take us back and tell us about your educational background? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, grew up in Wisconsin, um, where my parents lived for basically 33 years. Um, after doing my high school work there, I did my undergraduate studies at Rice University in Houston, where I studied, I was a dual major, so it's biochemistry and cell biology, as well as political science. Immediately after my undergraduate, I moved to Stanford, where I did a PhD in cancer biology. And after my PhD, so in my PhD, I actually studied something very different from what I study now. I studied uh epidermal differentiation and epithelial cancers. So still looking at the interplay between normal development and cancer, but also um, in a very different system. From there, I went on to do my postdoc at uh, UCSF with Dr. Mm -hmm. Arnold Kriegstein, where I worked on normal human brain cortical development using single cell RNA sequencing approaches and studied uh, both the normal brain cortical organoids and glioblastoma, which is a common form of adult brain cancer. So uh, after my postdoc, I started my lab at UCLA and it's been exactly one year. So oh, okay. um, that's, that's where I am now. Yeah, and uh, uh, you, you said you, you, were, you had a political science as your bachelor's degree, am I correct? It was and, my second major, yes. Yes, I so, I my, so my question is, why do you choose political science and biology as well? Yeah, so, um, you know, I always loved science and I knew that I wanted to um, be involved in research. And when I was an undergrad, I worked in a lab, but I also had a lot of other passions. So when I was a undergrad, I was on the debate team, which was an extension of some of the work, some of the activities that I did as a high schooler. And being on the debate team was the most fun thing that I could do during college. It was really awesome to be able to travel with the team, to be able to engage in these arguments um, and really understand how rational arguments are constructed much in a way that a scientist does actually and also to stay abreast of current events and so it felt like it was um, very natural to also do a second degree and because of um, you know my interest in many of the classes that were there I started taking a couple and realized that it made sense to do a second major and so I really enjoyed that process and I thought that it was a good way for me to activate different parts of my brain which are a little bit different than science classes but also I think added significantly to the um to our ability to really to my ability to really understand logic and reasoning and ultimately, I decided to pursue the scientific track and go into lab science. But I think that that political science um, background and the debate team was really foundational in my um, career so far. Yeah. So uh, you also mentioned your PhD work it was work with epithelial tissue dif uh, uh, differentiation and neoplasms. So mm -hmm. can you explain a more about what they are? Sure. So. Um, the epithelia are a type of tissue which comprise almost the it's the majority of tissues in our body. So the most common and most prevalent epithelia is the skin, and that covers obviously our whole body and is a very interesting tissue because it's constantly regenerating. We basically replace our entire skin over the course of one to two months. And so there's an active stem cell component, but it's also a system in which you can really study developments and differentiation trajectories in real time from samples of any age or any individual. And so it's, an, it's a perfect tissue to really look at human. Um, the human skin is actually quite different from the mouse skin, much like the brain, it's expanded um, compared to the mouse. And so studying the way in which the stem cells or the keratinocytes of the skin give rise to the differentiated layers was a really great opportunity to learn a lot of technologies and techniques and understand how basic differentiation works. Um, and, you know, it's a complex regulated process that needs to be kept in check because when you have these stem cells in the skin, they can easily be co-opted to 
have to generate a cancer. And especially when it comes to skin, you're getting a lot of external insults. And so you're getting the toxic rays of UV, you're getting all kinds of um, external, you know, chemicals or anything that could be uh, transforming those stem cells into cancer. And so it's a really amazing model to look at that interplay between normal differentiation and cancer because of the um, tight connection there. And so um, the work that I did as a PhD student was to first learn bioinformatics and really understand some of the genes that are different over the time period of differentiation, and also to look at next generation sequencing data sets from cancer. Mm -hmm. This was around the time period when next generation sequencing was becoming accessible and popular, but where the tools to analyze this data were very nascent. And so we were able to um, I was very lucky to develop my bioinformatics skill set there. And so this was something that I used bioinformatics to really um, understand normal skin development, as well as understand how things are different in cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for your postdoc, you said you work with Dr. Arnold Craigstein. He's a renowned, no, no, he's a really famous scientist. Uh, how do you work with Dr. Craigstein help your career in neuroscience? Um, working with Dr. Craigstein uh, was absolutely transformational because as I mentioned, I came from a different field and mm -hmm. Arnold really took a chance on me. And the reason he took a chance on me was because I did have that bioinformatics background. And oh. um, while I was starting my PhD, the kind of bulk RNA sequencing was just coming online. But when I started my postdoc, the single cell sequencing was becoming really popular. And Arnold and his team, including Tom Nowakowski and Alex Pollan were really spearheading a lot of the single cell approaches in the developing human brain, but they had a ton of data and they needed more people who could do the analysis. And so for that reason, um, Arnold doesn't typically always take people who are outside of the field, but it was a really good opportunity. And working with him, what I really appreciated is he is a visionary and he is very good at understanding the big picture of what's going on, but he really allowed me to develop as a leader and as a scientist and find my own path. So when I wanted to do a comparison between the normal developing human brain and organoids, he encouraged it. When I wanted to do a similar study between normal brain development and brain cancer, he enabled it. And so that really helped me um, replicate some of the concepts that I was excited about from my PhD, the normal development and the cancer, but also really helped me also enter into the neuroscience field. He gave me opportunities to speak at conferences. He um, sent me to these conferences, which is the starting point. He introduced me to a lot of people. Um, he invited me to various dinners when visiting faculty were speaking. And so all of these ways in which he gave me exposure and he gave me the opportunity to lead in the lab were really transformational for my career because it meant that as a newcomer to the field, I was able to establish myself as someone who works in the field and who understands the field quite early on, which meant that after four and a half years of postdoc, I was ready to start my own lab. Whereas I think in a different training environment where it was a little bit more protected or sheltered, I wouldn't have been able to do this, at least not as quickly as I did. Yeah. So you switch from bioinformatics to neuroscience. I was just wondering, why do you switch fields? So my switch was more from the study of the skin to um, the study of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, both in my PhD and in my postdoc, I've worked on using bioinformatics to understand uh, different parts of differentiation in cancer. So I do like mm -hmm. to say that I'm both a informatician and a wet lab biologist. And I think that that's really important. But the reason that I switched fields is because when I started my PhD, what I was most looking for was a um, solid training environment. I wanted to be in a context where um, I could really just establish myself as a a scientist, learn how to be a good mm -hmm. scientist. And that's why I did my PhD. And Paul Kavari, who was my PhD mentor, had a lot of PhD students. They had a great track record. And I was reasonably interested in the science. But my passion has always been the understanding of the human brain. I think that the human brain is the most beautiful structure that has ever been created by biology. And I think that it's an absolute wonder. And so that's why I wanted to you know, once I had skills that I felt were transferable, I really wanted to move into neuroscience. And that's why I made the switch. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's, that's actually interesting because uh, I interviewed many scientists and uh, Dr. Sean Wu, he switched from, so he was a, he, he actually did hematology first and he switched to cardiology. So I just found that interesting that many scientists are like switching fields, you know? Yeah. You know, I think it's one of those things where um, being a scientist means mm -hmm. that you are able to ask questions and you're able to design experiments, be they computational or um, experimental, and you can analyze that data and interpret something about it. And the system in which you do it is shouldn't be, you know, once you enter that system, that's the last thing that you can ever do. We're all learners and being a scientist means being a learner. And so I think it's quite normal for scientists to explore new areas because it piques their interest. So your research area is on the human brain creation. Uh, can you explain maybe generally or specifically how human brains are created? Sure. Um, yeah, so my lab studies both normal human brain development and brain cancer. Mm -hmm. And the general principle of human brain development is that you have a stem cell or a um, that generates essentially many different cell types. And so we for focus on the cortex and the cortex emerges from an initially uniform. So basically the cells appear to be more or less the mm -hmm. same neuroepithelial sheet. This is a single layer of cells, which um, are stem cells, and they start to give rise to radial glia. And radial glia are the neural progenitor cells of the cortex. Um, there are many subtypes, so different, um, you know, subcategories of radial glia, but initially they start as one category and then they diversify over development. The radial glia um, initially directly give rise to neurons, but very quickly they start creating what are known as intermediate progenitor cells. Mm -hmm. We refer to these as the transit amplifying cells. So basically these are populations that essentially serve to expand the number of cells in the cortex. Um, when you're going from a stem cell to the actual cells of the brain, there's a large number of cells that need to be created from a relatively small population. Mm -hmm. And so these IPCs basically serve as an amplification. They create more cells. Those then differentiate into newborn neurons. And so these neurons, um, they're at the lower, it's called the ventricular zone or the subventricular zone. And that's right by the ventricle or the fluid filled area of the brain that provides nutrients to the developing brain and ultimately actually lasts through adulthood. So the newborn neurons are born here, but then they migrate up to the top of the brain. So essentially what you would see at the top of the cortex, which is right under the skull. And um, they migrate along the um, processes of the radial glia. So the radial glia are basically like these long cells and they have one process that's touching the ventricle that I mentioned and another one that goes all the way to the top mm -hmm. of the cortex and the neurons will migrate above the, uh, along that and they'll start to make the six layers of the cortex. So the human cortex has six layers of neurons and these are laid down in an inside out fashion. So layer six goes first and then you go upwards. And so over time, they first make the deep layers, then they make the upper layers. And then once most of the neurons are uh, born, the radial glia progenitors switch to a process called gliogenesis. So making the neurons is neurogenesis, making the glia, which are another major cell type of the brain, um, are, is, are made with gliogenesis. And the glia essentially are the support cells that enable a lot of the connections and the processing that happens from the neurons. You need both neurons and glia for the brain to function. Mm -hmm. So first you make the neurons, then you start making the glia. And those glia include um, oligodendrocyte precursor cells, which make oligodendrocytes, which produce something called myelin, which basically insulates the neuronal connections. There's many other roles for these cells mm -hmm. as well, but it's, you know, there's a lot going on. And then also astrocytes. Um, and so these are the major populations that are made during cortical development. And the big question that we're trying to understand is there's a lot of ways in which these cells are diverse. So there's a lot of different cell types. There's a lot of area specifications. So different parts of the cortex have different functions. Um, but they are the cells that make up those um, areas are somewhat different. They're similar to one another, but they're not all the same, which makes sense because they have different functions. Um, and then 
there's a lot of ways those combinations of things make hundreds or thousands of cell types. And what we're trying to really understand is how is it that this very, you know, straightforward cell type at the beginning actually winds up doing all of these things? When does that specialization happen? What cues are there that tell a cell what to become? How do the stem cells change over time? And this is something that we're interested in because one, we want to know how the cortex is made, but also um, if we can understand this, we can understand better how things like neurodevelopmental disorders, such as autism arise, as well as how we can make these cell types in a dish so that if we have a neurodegenerative disorder, we might be able to really specify the exact type of cell that is being, that is degenerating so that we can figure out how we could make that cell, put it back in a human brain and allow it to integrate, to restore some of the function. And so these are all big questions, um, but ultimately it starts with understanding how does the radial, how do the radial glia of the cortex give rise to all of these different cell types? And then why are these radial glia, how and why are they reactivated in brain cancer to again undergo this process, but in a very aberrant context? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so recently uh, many scientists have used stem cells for either like you know, kind of regenerate parts of the brain, or some of them are trying to use stem cells to heal many, uh, you, know, you know, many uh, uh, disorders. Uh, for example, uh, Dr. Jean Lauren, she's trying to use stem cells to heal Parkinson's. So I thought it was interesting. So with all these like stem cells going on, I know you talked about previously how like stem cells can be dangerous. And if you, you know, inject them into a human, they could cause cancer. But do you think stem cells will have an even like bigger role in neuroscience in the foreseeable future? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the work that Dr. Loring is doing and others is really transformational in the understanding mm -hmm. of how stem cells can be used therapeutically. Um, the brain is one of the few organs of the body that really doesn't have a large or potentially any, it's somewhat controversial in the field, um, stem cell compartment in the adult. So regeneration or reactivation of the normal um, processes are not possible, which is why we need these types of stem cell technologies. But I think ultimately the question is, you know, can we make the cells that you need that are being lost in the brain? Can mm -hmm. we make them in the dish? And I think that the answer is yes. I think that there's enough data to show that, that that can happen. Depending on what that cell type is, sometimes the quality with which we make these cells or the reliability which we are able to do it varies. But especially in Parkinson's where you're losing specific, um, very specific cell types, you know, that seems very practical. And then I think the second question is, you know, how can we integrate those cells into the brain? And in some cases, it might be very easy. And in other cases, that might be more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. But I do think that in the next 20 to 30 years, we will see a lot more stem cell therapies for a variety of brain diseases and disorders. And I think that that's mm -hmm. incredibly exciting. Yeah, so one of your research is on neural stem cell phase specification. Uh, your lab studies how initially uniform stem cells, uh, they orchestrate the generation of expansive cortical uh, cellular uh, diversity. But however, at the same time, they can reactivate to, to develop cancers. So my, so my question is, can you explain what cortical cellular diversity is and like how you're able to accomplish this? Sure. So basically what we're doing is we're trying to understand how do you make all of the cell types that exist in the brain? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, as I explained, there's this whole process of cortical development. And we really mm -hmm. want to know what is it that tells the radial glia what to make? And then is that cell more of a generic mm -hmm. cell type? or is it already specialized to become whatever it ultimately will be when it grows up? And so the way in which we're working on this is really using these models called cortical organoids. So cortical organoids are made from stem cells in a dish. And basically what you do is you take stem cells, which can make any cell in the body. So they could make the brain, they could make the liver, they could make the lung. And you take 10,000 of them, you put them in a dish, and you give them certain molecules that will basically direct them to make the brain. And within the brain, they'll make the cortex. And so we grow these organoids in a dish over the course of you know, about 15 weeks. And during that time frame, we can see the emergence of the major cell populations that exist in the cortex. Now, this is not a system that we invented. This has been um, pioneered over about the last 10 years by a number of uh, 
great leaders in the field. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing is we are using some of the data that we have from the normal developing human brain to understand and make hypotheses about which genes are important for different processes. So one of the things we're interested in is how do you make the areas of the brain, the areas of the cortex. So the prefrontal cortex, which you may have heard of, is frequently dysregulated in a lot of disorders, including neuropsychiatric disorders, as well as neurodevelopmental disorders. And the prefrontal cortex um, allows for a lot of cognition and judgment that is important for functioning. And it's very different than the visual cortex, which is at the back of the brain, which basically integrates visual signals and processes them so that we can interpret what's happening in our outside world. So these are two cortical regions that are specified very early in development. And we can see from looking at single cells. From normal development, things that are similar and different about them. And this allows us to have hypotheses that we can then use the organoid because in the actual human brain, you can't make any changes, but in the organoid, you can start to use various technologies to modulate the gene expression of these genes. You can turn genes on, you can turn genes off. Um, and so we're using the organoid basically to do that and ask, how does this change in specific cell types? Mm -hmm. And that's, what's really exciting to us because it gives us an opportunity to start to understand what is the actual mechanics, like what this, or that activates this, which activates this, so that we can really understand how that specialization occurs. So that's the main system that we're using um, to do a lot of this work and to really understand cell fate specification. Mm. Yeah, so you talked about how you're trying to understand human brain development. So with this understanding, do you think you know, scientists could potentially you know, solve Down syndrome or any type of you know, disorders that happen at, at, at like at a at our age, no? So um, Down syndrome is a chromosomal abnormality, which uh -huh. you basically have trisomy. You have three of a specific chromosome. And, you know, people are really understanding what is the impact of having more of specific genes. And so um, I think that potentially we are a little bit far from that, but it I don't see why with more understanding of exactly mm -hmm. what each of those genes is doing, why we couldn't use certain technologies to um, either suppress those genes or activate other genes that would basically offset the function to mitigate some of the phenotypes that you see with Down syndrome. So I think that that's an example of something that, you know, is probably a, a lot more complex, but um, could happen in the future. Mm -hmm. So my question, so I know you talked about how stem cells, you know, they can cause cancers as well. So my question is, how can neural stem cells, they can be helpful to the human brain? Because we've seen scientists trying to create the human brain, some parts of the human brain back with the stem cells, but at the same time, they can activate brain cancers as well. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Like, uh, so my question is, uh, how can uh, stem cells, like, uh, but how can stem cells be like reactivated to develop cancers? Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Um, this is a really big question in the field. So we know that cancers do have stem cells mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of experiments that have been done that, you know, you can take cells from a patient, put it in a mouse, and it'll cause the cancer to regrow. Mm -hmm. So we know that the stem cells exist. Mm -hmm. What we don't know is how and when they reemerge in the brain. So there's a couple different theories on this. One is that there could be some stem cells that basically instead of differentiating or disappearing or dying after development, basically become what's known as quiescent. Quiescent is basically like a hibernation. And we haven't found these from a number of different strategies that we've used, but it's possible that the reason we haven't found these is when they go into that hibernation, they completely change what they are. So they don't look that similar to the stem cell during development or when it's reactivated during cancer. And basically some type of instigation, be it a mutation or something about the environment, causes these cells to come out of hiber hibernation. And because they're not supposed to be there, they create the cancer. So that's one model, which is that you don't actually reactivate them. You basically just wake them up. 
Another option is, you know what, maybe these stem cells actually do disappear. They don't exist anymore. As we age, as after we're born, once we're through childhood, like the stem cells actually do disappear. But there are other cells in the brain that continue to divide. So for example, the astrocytes continue to divide through our lifespan. And maybe as an astrocyte accumulates mutations, it goes backwards in the differentiation. So the astrocyte came from a radial glia, maybe it acquires certain mutations that basically de-differentiated. And that might sound like a little bit like a time machine type sci-fi kind of situation, but it's actually been really well shown in a lot of different um, systems that cancer has many core um, identities that are more similar to development and that there is this process of de-differentiation in cancer. So that's not a crazy idea. And then maybe once you have that stem cell, it basically starts to read, go through the process of development and makes all these cell types. And so this is a really big question in the field because understanding how that works can give us a better sense of when do these cancers arise? Because when they're diagnosed, um, a patient usually only has 12 to 18 months to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we knew that it was a slow growing cancer so that you know there's a long period of time where this slowly happens, then potentially you could screen for it much earlier. And as we know from many other cancers, catching a cancer early can be really effective for treatment. Or if it's something where there's a de-differentiation process, maybe we could then understand how to quickly differentiate the cancer. So there's a lot of reasons why understanding how and why this happens will be interesting. But currently we don't have a clear answer on how or why these stem cells mm -hmm. reemerge in cancer. Yeah, so you're, uh, for your research in neural stem cell phase specification, you're using integrated single cell omics, right? So my question is, what are single cell omics and why are you using this specific approach in primary tissues and cortical um, organoids, which we're going to go a bit further? Sure. So um, as we mentioned, right, the cell, the brain is comprised mm -hmm. of all of these different cells. Mm -hmm. And so single cell is basically instead of mushing everything together and getting an average, you get individual data from one cell at a time. Mm -hmm. And this is important because when you do um, non-single cell sequencing, you're going to get a composite. It's basically going to look like um, abstract art. Mm -hmm. And so you're basically going to have, you know, all kinds of colors everywhere. But I don't know if you've seen like um, some of these pointillists like George Surratt. And actually there's an analysis package um, mm -hmm. for single cell called Surratt where you have like individual dots that make up the picture. Mm -hmm. This allows you to basically look at those individual dots instead of the smear of color. And that's really important because what's true for which genes are turned on in a stem cell are not going to be the same genes that are turned on in a neuron. Mm -hmm. But if you average them together, you won't be able to figure out which of the genes are on in the stem cell versus which of the genes are on in the neuron. And so um, the approach of single cell sequencing allows us to really understand what's happening in each cell population at a time. And you're also developing these, you know, small... No, I, I guess uh, cortical uh, in in a uh, in the dish, right? Yeah, the so, organized. Yeah, the organized. Yes. So I met a uh, Dr. Jake Goldberg Krishnan. He created a mini brain. Dr. Sean Wu created a mini heart. So both of them had told me that an organized they take a lot of years to make. Sometimes one year, and that's why you require a lot of people to in your lab to you know just make these two for modeling purposes. So my thing is, what potential ways are there to celebrate the purpose of manufacturing? these type of organoids, organoids yeah, sorry, for modeling, for these modeling stuff in your lab? So I, there are ways in which you can keep mm -hmm. these organoids for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, we have really focused on those early stages of development. Mm -hmm. so we usually keep them for about 15 weeks, which is still long, but it's not quite as long. Mm -hmm. And each person in my lab has their own project and they kind of make the organoids for what they're doing. And so we figured out a way to make that pipeline really helpful for kind of what's going on. But um, because of some of the innovations of people who've come before us, we have really established good protocols and we have um, good directions to go with these. So um, you know, we're excited about the system. We think it gives us a lot of potential to study and model the developing human brain, but mm. also we aren't, um, you know, we don't have too many other problems with it. Mm. 
you're establishing some atlases for the primary developing human brain. Uh, so Dr. Sean was doing the same thing, but he's doing it with the human heart. So which I found pretty interesting. So like, are you gonna publish this when you're finished? And like, and and like, what is the purpose of of an atlas? Sure. Um, just like the purpose of an atlas is to really understand where things are and, um, you know, mm -hmm. what exists where. So it's it's a little bit like a map, right? You see which city is where yes. and um, where they are with relation to each other. So in atlasing the developing human brain, we're really trying to understand all of the cell types that exist so that we can have an understanding of how you make this very cool structure. And in order to do that, we need to know what the cell types are how they change over time. And then that will allow us to understand what happens normally, but also give us a blueprint for where are the places in which things could go wrong during neurodevelopment, um, causing neurodevelopmental disorders, or that could either be the basis for neuropsychiatric disorders. So that's why we wanna do this. It gives us an inventory of what's there. And we're starting to use spatial technologies to understand exactly where they lay on that map. As for publishing it, we actually just published um, the data set. This was work that was started, um, that was completed and done in my postdoc with Arnold Kriegstein and Carmen Sandoval Espinoza. And that paper actually came out in October in Nature as part of a package from the Brain Initiative, where there were a number of Atlas scale data sets generated in the mouse, as well as in some non-human primates, and in our case, in the human, as well as a couple other papers that touched on the human. And so that data is published. Um, we are now in my lab trying to use some of that data to really ask these questions that I was talking about and you know develop those hypotheses so we can apply them to the organoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're also working on glioblastoma and adult brain cancer. So what is it and why is it the most common and aggressive form of adult brain cancer? Yeah, so glioblastoma is um, a brain cancer from the adults. It basically is characterized by very uh, diffuse um, integration into the rest of the brain, which is also what makes it so difficult to surgically remove. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really trying to ask these same questions. What cell types exist in this cancer? Um, we don't know why it's the most common, but we can start to ask that. Um, it is the most aggressive, so maybe that's why it's the most common. If it's less aggressive, we just don't see it. And so we only see the versions that become this problematic. Um, and we're trying to understand what are the cell types? How are they made? And how can we stop them from being made? And, you know, this is a difficult problem because there are so many cell types. They're pretty different than normal development, but it's something that we're excited about and we're hoping we can really tackle. Mm -hmm. So uh, I actually went on Google and I found that like some people try to use radiation therapy and chemotherapy and also maybe viral therapy to treat glioblastoma, but it's not that effective. So why do you think these ways aren't that effective to treat glioblastoma? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think that there's a couple of reasons. Um, we do know that there's a lot of different um, cell types that exist in the mm -hmm. tumor. And it's possible, we don't really know why this many cell types exist in these tumors, but it's possible that some of those treatments effectively target one or two populations. But if there's 11 populations in the tumor, then the other six, seven, eight, nine take on the ability to basically generate more of the tumor. Mm -hmm. So that's one possibility. One of the theories that's also out there, which you know is very um, promising, is just like we were talking about the cell hibernation before. Um, mm -hmm. It's thought that, and this is work from uh, Dr. Luis Parada and others in the field, but it's um, including Vivian Tabar. It's thought that some of the stem cell populations that do exist in these tumors are indeed quiescent. And what that means is they're not dividing. So most of the therapies that exist are going after the cells that are actively dividing. But if these cells still remain, they still have the opportunity to wake up, make a bunch of tumor, and then go back to sleep. And so you're not going to catch them when they're awake. And that's going to be a problem for treatment. And so the theory that I have is if we really understand which cells in that tumor, so of those 11 cell types, for example, this is just an example, it varies from tumor to tumor. If we know which ones are actually making the tumor versus which ones are kind of hanging around and helping, 
And we can identify, look, it's these three populations or these four populations. Mm -hmm. And you essentially, instead of going after one and then redirecting the traffic to make the rest of the tumor, you essentially put up roadblocks for Uh all of the problematic populations. Then I think that we might have a chance of really stopping the tumor because what's really problematic about these tumors is you take them out surgically, you do whatever treatments you go for almost all, they, they always reoccur and they almost always reoccur somewhere different. So they migrate to a new spot and then they reestablish themselves. Mm -hmm. If you can stop them where they are, that surgical resection plus stopping them, hopefully that could be enough to really, um, extend, if not save the patient's life. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're also, uh, you talked about, you you talked about tumors, but your lab's also working, developing new ways of culturing tumors in vitro. So my, my question is, so there must be some kind of old ways scientists use to culture tumors. So why aren't these old ways like effective? Sure. Yeah, no, this is something that's um, really interesting to us. We don't fully understand, but as you know, the human brain is very special Mm -hmm. and this is great for all of the great things that we can do. It also seems to be very special for a unique place that brain tumors grow as aggressive as these tumors are. And as fast as they kill people it's really hard to grow them outside of the human brain. You can put them in a dish, but not all of the cell types survive. And some tumors just won't grow in a dish. Mm -hmm. You can put them in a mouse brain, but again, they change what they are, their identity is. Mm -hmm. So we're working on growing them in a cortical organoid where it may have some of the actual context of the actual human brain because they're human cells. And we think that this may allow us to add one more tool where we look in the mouse, we look in the dish, we look in the cortical organoid so that we can really understand what is it about the tumor that's really making it tick so that we can stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, let's say once you've found a cure to glioblastoma in the future, uh, do you plan to put this on clinical trials or potentially commercialize this in the future? Um, We are absolutely eager to find treatments for this. And, um, we are, my lab works with some of the people who are involved in the brain spore, which is a consortium group of labs at UCLA Mm -hmm. that study brain cancer. And we would love to put things into clinical trial. There's a really great infrastructure to do that at UCLA. And so I think that, you know, that would be of huge interest. And right now we're just trying to figure out how things work so we can really design those drugs and treatments Mm -hmm. that we can stop uh, what's going on. Yeah, so I have another question. It's not really related to research, but it's related to brain a bit. Uh, I'm not sure you heard of Elon Musk or Neuralink. Uh, so course, ba- yeah. Yes, yes. So a lot of scientists said that Neuralink is bad science fiction and like it's, 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 it's not theoretically possible. So what do you have to say regarding this new company? And do you agree that what Elon is doing is bad science fiction? Um. I don't have strong comments on it. You know, I think that it's great when people are thinking outside of the box. I think that it's very Mm -hmm. ambitious and I think that it would be really cool if it works, but I'm a little bit skeptical as all scientists are when you're going into something new. Um, And so I'm just curious to see what happens and if it works, that's great. But um, you know, most, most things in science fail. And so, uh, you know, hopefully they've got a good team there and um, I wish them the best. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is the future of neuroscience and biotech? I mean, I think neuroscience has a huge amount of opportunity in biotech. I think mm-hmm. that there's a lot of things that we're starting to understand about the human brain and a lot of ways in which we can use a lot of technology and um, drug treatments and other things to mm-hmm. do a lot in terms of both disease, aging, etc. And mm-hmm. so I think it's a really cool, exciting, expanding space. I personally feel very lucky to be a academic scientist. I think it's my dream job. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happy where I am, but I really am excited to see what happens in the neuroscience biotech space. Yeah. So uh, what advice do you receive during your career that shaped your professional development or success? Yeah. I mean, I think that the, I wouldn't say that it's like explicit advice that I sat Mm -hmm. down with someone and that they gave me this advice. Mm -hmm. I think that both my PhD mentor and my postdoc mentor have really encouraged me both in what they've said and the way in which they've acted and um, supported me 
to explore the science, to follow the science and never be afraid of trying new things. So whether it's trying a new field, whether it's learning a new technique, whether it's learning a new analysis, always to be fearless in doing whatever it takes mm-hmm. to make the science grow forward. And I think that that's really enabled me to work in a lot of different um, scientific spaces. And it's what I'm encouraging my own students to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what additional advice would you give to students who want to pursue either biology or biotech? I would say that you should never feel like you are done learning. And I've seen this in various spaces where people enter and they're like, you know, I would love to study this, but I'm too old to do immunology or neuroscience because I haven't taken the classes. And I would say that that's never true. It's especially not true for a student who's incoming into their PhD. If you're not in a PhD to learn, then why are you there? Um, And so I would say, don't listen to anyone who says that because you haven't done something before, you can't do it in the future. I think that that holds people back. And as long as people take the time to follow their interests, they'll be really successful. Yeah, and is there, uh, and and, uh, no, I've asked a lot of questions, so I want to bring this to you, but uh, is there uh, anything else that we didn't touch upon that, you know, we should tell our audience? No, I think that's it. I really appreciate your time Uh and taking the time to do this. And I think it's wonderful that you're doing this type of podcast. Mm -hmm. And I would like to encourage you and others who have an interest in science to really pursue those interests. Um, So thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Drew, for being part of this episode and giving me the opportunity to interview you so people can get to know more about your insights into your science and your research. Thank you, Karen.